And so to really begin, the exhibit currently at Papillon from which this discussion springs from Harlem to Metuchen, Lens on Black Life, includes a series of photographs by members of the Kamuinje Workshop, a fine arts collective of Black photographers that formed in New York in 1963. Now the word itself comes from the Bantu language of East Africa with a literal meaning of a group working together but carrying the connotations of genuine fellowship and community, a, a sense of family and a sense of warmth in that working together. This group is the longest continually active group of Black photographers in the nation. Now, while that alone calls for great respect, as you will see, that is actually the least of it for this group. Their members have been accorded honors and awards in many areas, both of photographic excellence and community service. And while, as they say, Black is in now, among white-led cultural institutions, the group of Kamuinje artists has always been more interested to both focus their lenses and their learning within the Black community itself. Only now, at last, are the major institutions beginning to recognize what a cultural treasure we all have in your work. What I personally appreciate in your background is that all of you are highly successful working commercial photographers, as well as exhibiting artists. All have published books of your photographs, all have been given prestigious awards in your field. So let's get to know a little bit about each individual artist, beginning with Lola Flash. Hi, Lola. Are you mute? Hi, Linda, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And thanks it's, for everyone to, uh, for coming. Good. It is so good to have you with us. Your work seems to have focused strongly on issues of justice of every kind, racial, sexual, ageist. And you have received lots of positive notoriety for it. Lost something here. Ah, there we go. I'm good. Um, you've been invited to create work for an exhibit at the Ford Foundation. You've been given a residency mm -hmm. in Woodstock, and you will have time later in this program to talk more about some of your other series. I would like to hear about your SALT series, the women over the age of 70, those women well-known and still dynamic. I feel a personal connection to this series simply by being in the same age category. Can you share a bit about the series? What got you started? How you selected your subjects? It, they were very carefully orchestrated, photographed in their home. Talk to us a bit about that, Lola. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Um, the <clears throat> I think uh, the SALT series seems to be a, a favorite of many people. Um, I, I believe it's because we can all kind of relate to it either for our age, like us, Linda, or <laughs> right. uh, you know, our, our favorite grandmother or you know, an elder in your family or uh, you know, in the community. Um, and that's really kind of how it started, you know, my my grandmother, my mom was a single mom, so um, my grandmother took a lot, took care of me um, a lot, and uh, you know I admired her so much. Um, you know, it wasn't until I got older that I realized the the sort of uh, the the limits that that occur when you're uh, when you become an older woman. You know, I, I always kind of say that when you're sort of 18 to 28, you're you know the it girl. Um, and then you sort of finish that, that uh, group, that age group, and people kind of forget about you. You know, they don't see the beauty in older people. Um, and I, I always saw the beauty in my grandmother and in a lot of the older people in my community. So it's really um, talking about 
showing that beauty. And even a lot of the women, they don't see it in themselves either. So yeah. you know, it's kind of like the two hours that I spend with them, they know that the crux of my work is really about beauty. And so I think that they, they then, I hope that they then find the beauty that they, they lost because society didn't honor that beauty, you know? Um, so mm -hmm. this particular one actually is a, was a member of Kamonge, uh, Tony Parks. Uh, she was um, Gordon Parks' daughter. And you can see actually on the mantle, there's her and her father. And, uh, you know, I mean, till the day she died, which was several years ago, you know, you can tell just by the, her stance that, you know, she has like what my mom would say, chutzpah, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> she, she did not, if she didn't agree with you, she wasn't going to agree with you, you know what I mean? And, but, but she was elegant. And she, you can see the elegance in her, you know, because she was Gordon Parks' daughter. So she had all these amazing stories about like, you know, having to leave America when uh, Malcolm X was shot, for instance, you know, like there's just so many different uh, parts of her life that were steeped in history. Um, can we go to another one? Robert? There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, this one is uh, Thomas, Alice, ha Thomas Allen Harris's mom. Um, and so a lot of the people, I, a lot of my models are people's parents, my friend's parents or my friend's grandparents. Um, so usually they're people that I kind of, you know, know. Um, and, but within that, they're also, um, you know, amazing. That's the other part of it is that they're also amazing artists or they're still engaged in community. Um, she's a writer and, um, you know, she, all of the women are doing something. None of them spend their day watching TV. You know? <laughs> and so I, I always say that, you know, I, I want to grow up to be like them. Um, as the series gets, uh, you know, can continue, it's almost all of my work is ongoing. Um, I'm getting close to the age of 70. And um, I think that I never seem to be able to figure out when to end the series, but I think that, you know, on February, February 10th, when I turn 70, I'm going to take a self portrait and then that's going to be the end of the series. Oh, um, that's great. Yeah. yeah. But the women are from all over because my work is, uh, I really have a global approach to, to my work. Um, <laughs> you know, I asked one woman who I photographed in Trinidad, you know, what was her experience with racism? And she really had none until she came to America. So, you know, issues around all the kind of isms that I'm talking about, I find it's very interesting to find out how these area, how these issues, uh, how they turn up in pe different people's societies, you know, all over the world. Oh, that's so interesting. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I'm sorry, did, were there uh, any others? I thought I saw a couple earlier, uh, just to show the folks, I won't talk. Robert, do you have, you there's, had a couple others. Yeah, there's Corrine. She's a photographer and she makes these uh, beautiful um, brooches. Oh, okay. we're holding up. That's the end of that. Okay. Oh, oh yes. yeah. this, this is Coho. She just turned 99 like last month, last week. Wow. And I went and had um, lunch, dinner with her. Amazing. Um, <laughs> She does, uh, she does, she actually has work at the Queens, the Noguchi Museum here in Queens. Ah. It's her, um, her beautiful Sumie paintings. Oh, yeah, that's behind so her. It's not on video, so it's just. Really neat. Now, while much of your work evidences you as in the thick of things, Lola, culturally, on the street, as it were, dealing with the issues of the current, cultural concerns. You also include on your website, that formal place that we show our face to the world, um, a section called the scent of autumn. And that deals just with formal concerns of color and texture rather than concept. So my question is, how much of that is consciously a part of your other photographs? And do you often take a breath, as it were, just to plunge into nature and those very formal things um, and allow those things to inform and refill you? Yeah, thank you for asking me about this series because I, I think that often when I'm on a panel, uh, people focus on my portraits and my, my sort of landscape seems to be uh, left behind. So uh, 
Sense of Autumn is really, I think about them as my watercolors. Ah. Um, so I, um, you know, during the, the, the late eighties, I was here in New York and I was a, a big AIDS activist. And I suppose once you're an AIDS activist, you're always an AIDS activist. Um, and, uh, you know, I used to always say, it's like when I, graduate, when I graduated from college in 81, that was the first year that someone was diagnosed with, with HIV, um, which we now know was further back, but that's the first time New York Times reported on it. So I felt as though I kind of, as soon as I graduated, I kind of got launched into this political realm uh, that dealt with my communities, you know? And so um, I used to always say to myself, um, you know, I'm never gonna take a beautiful picture until the AIDS crisis is over. Yeah. So you know, I continue taking these, you know, challenging photographs and working on issues that people don't really want to talk about. And when I got to about 40, you know, I said to myself, geez, I really, I really need a break. I really need to just take some fun pictures, you know. So, you know, I wanted to go back to the formal elements of art. You know, I went to art school. So, you know, composition, color, shape, yeah. um, line, texture, all of those things. And I, I kind of wanted to remind myself of how I used to be when I was a young photographer. And I just <laughs> went around and took pictures of, you know, cool lighting and everything, you know. And so, um, so yeah, so I said to myself, okay, even an activist needs a little bit of a break. Um, and I think it's also this kind of reminiscing of the summer. Um, you know, these are all taken in the fall, uh, mostly New York beaches. And I just really wanted to, you know, like find, find these things, you know, like most of my images are so sort of set up. I almost have them already in my head before I take them. But these, I just kind of like, I was like, oh, look at the light there, you know? And, and it's, so it was really kind of, um, rejuvenating for me to just have this work that had, I mean, almost anything I think I do has some kind of political overtone, but this here, I'm really focusing on the formal elements, like when I was little and I used to just take random photographs. <laughs> so that's kind of what, where these come from. Um, oh, yeah, and that, uh, that really intrigued me. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that, you know, you were interested to speak about it. So thank you so much. Um, okay. You know, I know we could actually fill this conversation about your fascinating vision and work with the entire evening. But okay human you. limits will not allow that. <laughs> so I thank you for these insights. And we'll hear more from you, though. And I, I'll be interested to hear those. So now, Colette. Colette Fournier, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. You fell in love with photography at an early age, pursued that, and directly became a hardworking photographer using your skills however it was needed in business. In your own words, you were always busy. Even in your early years, however, you were able to achieve grants and a solo exhibition in Rochester. The early 2000s, <clears throat> excuse me though, were professionally significant years for you. You acquired your MFA, you were invited to join Kamuenge and you began to work in education. And that last fact gives me a personal connection to you, the sharing of your art in formal educational settings as a teacher of many years. Your work is widely collected, published, and you are a recipient of numerous awards and recognitions. Now, out of all of that, one of the experiences that I read about that intrigued me the most was the opportunity you had to accompany two educational groups to Africa. Sounds like a dream to me. Can you share a bit about that, how it came to be, what it was like, details? You're on. Wow, well, I have to tell you that I was always working. Um, I had an opportunity through uh, an organization called PCP to make a list of my photographs and I had no idea that I had so many. <laughs> um, but the, the, just to you know, address your, your comment or your question, um, I would say, I don't, this is not mine. I don't know who's-, who's um, um, Robert, you're moving too fast here. Um, but I can say- 
Um, it, it, it's okay. I'll just I'll just keep keep talking because I know we have yeah. a time limit. Um, I can say that uh, I went to RIT in Rochester, and somehow or another, I stayed in the community afterwards, um, working in television, working in film, editing 60 millimeter film, working for a couple of television stations. Um, then I went to work for About Time Magazine, which was a monthly African-American um, publication. And through working for that magazine, I started to meet a lot of people in the community. When, when you're in college, that's a whole different community than when you get into the city and you're downtown, you're meeting people from other campuses. And I got to know a, an administrator at the University of Rochester, Dr. Frederick Jefferson, and he asked me if I would like to go to Africa three times <laughs> on three <laughs> separate trips, um, educational tours as, this, as a still photographer. So of course I couldn't say no. Um, and so that was my first trip. We went to Senegal, uh, we went to Senegambia. Um, and on the third trip, so we actually went um, February of 1987 and then another two trips the, the following year, April, I'm sorry, February of uh, 1988, and then February of 19, I think I'm getting the, the, the years wrong. But anyway, um, it was three trips in two years, basically. Mm. Um, and the interesting thing for me was before this happened, I had pre-visualized a slide presentation that I was going to put together of African images. And it was gonna be called The Faces and Places of West Africa. It was gonna be an audio visual presentation that accompanied sound effects and voiceover. And all of this was in my head. I knew the music that I was going to use and I was going to make sure that I gave everybody credit where credit you know, was <laughs> being right. very, very important, very important. You gotta get that credit, that byline. Oh, yeah. um, so that was my first three trips to Africa. I took my vaccines because you, you didn't have a choice. <laughs> um, and, you know, of course it was just absolutely um, fascinating. And I've had this thing about slavery since I was a child. I'm um, currently writing a book and so I address a lot of those particular issues. And I thought by going to Africa that was going to start to answer a lot of questions about slavery, why it existed. Um, the second trips to uh, West Africa were to, were to Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, that was Ghana, Togo, and Benin. Benin. Mm -hmm. And that was in 2007. Mm -hmm. At that time, I'd moved to Rockland County. I was working with the Journal News and the Bergen Record. And I became That's affiliated funny. with the yeah. dance group um, Chiku Awali, African Dance and Drum. And the head of that particular, the executive director was a woman named Alexandrina Dixon, who again, I knew from the community. I'm a very community oriented person, like all of us Kamoinge people, we're all community oriented. Um, and that's what we basically document is, you know, the, the uh, community. Um, so in going to um, Ghana, I, I think the second year we went was 2010 and we just, <clears throat> excuse me, exclusively stayed in Ghana. And so was that also for 2017. Mm -hmm. However, I found yes. that this Miss, Miss Drina, Alexandrina Dixon, head of Chico Awali, was going to be made a queen mother. And that totally just took me in a kind of another direction because I had to now be prepared to photograph like a four hour um, celebration or durbar wow. of her becoming a queen mother. And I, it still lives with me. It still lives with me. So that particular um, group of photographs I've edited, I've worked with, and I'm trying to present it to, I'm trying, um, to a museum. Actually, I'm, I'm trying to do something that's more of a kind of a mixed media. Um, so I'm not sure if I've answered all of your question, but I, I do want to just jump back to the first trip because the first trip um, 
from Rochester, I was actually able to take a train into Bamako, Mali. And the significance of that was Rochester's sister city was Bamako. So uh -huh. at some point we had had many visitors, mostly in the educational field, come to Rochester, University of Rochester. Um, I don't think RIT, I think it was mostly a connection with the University of Rochester. And we would take them around and they would talk to us and we reciprocated by, uh, you know, what, when I went back to, to Mali, to Bamako, I reciprocated by meeting some of them and staying at the governor's co compound. So it, it was a very interesting experience. Oh, very neat. Oh yeah, you, you have done well with answering my multiple questions around that. That, that must have been a wonderful experience for sure. Now, your work has been cited in a number of places as being by that of a documentarian who lifts it with artistic ambiance. So my question is, is that something that is a natural way of seeing for you? Or is that something that happens when you return to edit the work in, in your studio and strive for that, to work toward that? Or does it, is it just part and parcel of your, your way of working, your way of seeing? I, I think it's actually both. Um, oftentimes when you're, I also like to work in a series and um, oftentimes when you come upon an idea, you start to have some thoughts or some visual thoughts as to what you'd like to shoot. And it really just depends because when you get into the situation of photographing, um, I, I would say one of my most favorite shoots of this day had to be Hurricane Katrina. And that oh. was many, many years ago. But what happened is that, first of all, we got a grant. So as an artist, I didn't have to worry about the money. I was able to rent a car. I was able to fly to New Orleans. Mm. Um, I have family who I didn't even know at the time in um, Louisiana area, so I was very excited to go. Um, I didn't know what I was going to see. This was 18 months after when we got the um, Soros grant to uh, document the Gulf Coast, the Gulf area. Um, but, but the important thing about the shoot or the photography sessions was that I had time to do research. Uh. I took along my tape recorder, I recorded many people's stories. I had time to just hang out on corners with my cameras and talk to people. And everyone wanted to talk. Everyone had a story. Mm. Everyone was feeling destitute on a, on a lot of levels. Yeah. Um, I, I photographed a, a gentleman um, who showed his license uh, during the Hurricane Katrina. Uh, time, he had actually gone up to Newark, New Jersey, where he had family, you know, of course, with intentions of coming back. Mm -hmm. He actually sold Christmas trees. So it was an interesting story. But I photographed his license because he took out the license to show me that he was a New Jersey resident for a <laughs> short time. And, you know, it wasn't until afterwards that I noticed what I thought was a tattoo on his hand, but it was mold. Oh. And I started to notice that with a few of the people there that the mole had actually gotten into their skin, Ooh. literally. And, you know, so, I mean, there were just so many stories and there was no time when, when you're working for a newspaper, you're always on deadline. Mm. The good thing about the monthly magazine is that it gave you more time to either do your writing, do your, you know, your photography, your processing, your printing. So it gave you more time. Working with the daily paper, you don't have that kind of time. You have to really be quick on your feet. You've got to think, you've got to write your captions. You've got to get the information as accurate as possible. You need to know how to spell and read and write, you know, because you're a communicator. Um, but the Hurricane Katrina story, and then also the Queen Mother of Progress, um, I'm working that through. I actually came in first as a finalist with the um, Arts Westchester. Um, and that was one of six or seven different people. But I had to get the caption, which means I had to work with Miss Drina to get the captions, go back to Africa, talk to people 
about what was actually going on, what I was actually experiencing. Mm. So mm. it's a lot of work it, and it never ends. It just well, simply never ends. And, but, and those who aren't involved don't understand that, the tremendous amount of work, especially with photographers, they say, oh yes, you click the camera and there you go, <laughs> la-di-da. But uh, truly, yeah, um, that see, that's the thing that so impresses me about each of you, you have been and you are those continuously working artists. You are working artists. There are deadlines that you're forced to meet. And there's a lot of other information and art forms even, um, writing and thinking and, and organizing that need to be developed within doing the one piece that you're really focused on, as well as exhibiting. So I get it. I really get it. And I, I just can't tell you how impressed I am by all of it. I, I want to share a really, really quick story that in 1993, at that point, I was at Rockland Community College teaching a photography class and also the college's photographer. And I was part of the African American History Month Committee, you know, because I'm very Afrocentric. And I was approached to do this show called There is a World Through Our Eyes, the Perceptions and Visions of the African-American Photographer. Oh. I had no idea what I was curating, but it was 25 photographers, five lithographers, and a sculptor. <laughs> and it was multi-sided. It was, it was five different uh, galleries in Rockland County. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and I had no idea, I'm telling you, I had no idea what I was doing. I, you know, you just have a feel for certain things, you know, and you just put it together because it needs to get done uh, on deadline, yeah. on deadline. <laughs> on deadline. <laughs> That's it. That is it. Oh, listen, thank you so much, Colette. Again, we could sit and listen all evening just to you. So um, we need now, however, to move on to chat a little bit with Eli. Eli Reed. <laughs> well, welcome home, neighbor. <laughs> How cool is it that you grew up right down the street in Perth Amboy? Born in Linden, grew up in Perth Amboy, attended Arts High School in Newark. Not Arts High uh, School. The, 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 uh, <laughs> the which, which high school was it? It wasn't. A, I, I went to Perth Amboy High School. The, the art, uh, Newark School of Fine Industrial Arts is the uh, professional art school yeah. oh okay i i was confusing was that with that famous art school that was there oh okay so we daren't we daren't shortchange perth amboy high school <laughs> so thank you but now you call texas home so wow welcome back and what a professional life in between i i really don't know where to begin your awards for your photography stretch from 1981 through to this year you have given talks and lectures in such varied locations as the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York City to the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo. You've worked with such notable groups as Doctors Without Borders, Save the Children, as well as diverse publications. You've exhibited all over the world and have a permanent exhibition in the U.S. Embassy in Cambodia. You've worked on Oscar-winning films including A Beautiful Mind. With books and other projects still underway, I would like to highlight a comment you made about the core of your work. And unfortunately, I chose not to have any photographs for you to work off of because my questions for you are much more, um, dare I say, of the heart. Um, you said your work, well, the comment you made about the core of your work it is a meditation on being a human being. Now, one of the things I found striking about your work and the work of all your colleagues is its universality. It's a lens on Black life, but it speaks powerfully, even to me as a white woman of a certain age. So I, I'm going to ask you to speak a bit to that. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's um, um, when, during the, um, uh, the time I was growing up, the uh, civil rights movement was going on. And the interesting thing is that um, next door neighbor in Perth Amboy, there's the, a family, uh, 
Mr. Wade was the president of the NAACP and for Fanboy. So it's not just watching things go down on, on television or listening to radio, you know, that kind of thing. It was a, more of a connection. And I've been inspired uh, about different ways of communicating through movies, through I was a voracious reader, everything I get my hands on. I actually went to the library in Perfamily when, when I was 10 years old. So I heard about this great book called, uh, uh, what was the, no, this is a Crime and Punishment. So uh. I, I went to the um, uh, librarian and asked her, um, you know, where do I get to the book Crime and the Punishment? And she she looked at me, it probably is a strange look, and, and, and <laughs> to the section, the legal section <laughs> and of the library. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I was always interested in the rest of the world. Uh, the movie, uh, uh, <clears throat> you call Lawrence of, of, of um, Arabia. Arabia, and there's a movie called uh, Z, which is about a mm. thing that happened in, I, I mean, I was, and that movie Z, uh, because of a photographer and, and a reporter made them, some things come to light. And the, the soundtrack was like a Nikon motor drive. I think I later got a Nikon motor drive just because of that damn movie. Uh, <laughs> but the, there's so many things that, I mean, that, that connect you with the rest of the world. In fact, uh, the title of my, my last book, or uh, most recent book, is uh, well, I can't even call it my, the last book because some book was published I forgot about. <laughs> and, and it was uh, on my work in Black America, which was interesting, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, <laughs> anyway what happened is I was in uh, with my... Uh, friend, my best friend John Gulish and his niece uh, um, cousin, um, in for a drive. You know, I think it was a Sunday, a Sunday drive, and we were coming through. We uh, we come through Metuchen, and his engine blew up. Okay. And so I ended up. We ended up walking because there, there wasn't a bus that we saw, but we walked from Metuchen to Perth Amboy. Whoa, and, that's a walk. Yeah, and that's part of the reason for. You know, I mean, it was simmering in my head uh, a long walk home because it was a long walk and, <laughs> and the other thing is when i was in africa the first time i was working for national geographic and i remember you know walking a lot of places but looking at this the night sky at one time and thinking about per family the connection you know and that kind of connection and then the um bruce springsteen the song a long walk home and there it was i was <laughs> i was talking with my uh editor you know i said well what title we should have and just came out and they the uh, board of directors at the um, at the university of texas uh, for the publishing thing they su suggested that my name should be in there too but you know it's like little things that you know it's uh, there's always something happening um, i'm curious about everything and particularly about how people um you know how people move how they think how, how they love how they how they lose things. And I've been in a number of places where you see it face to face and you don't walk away from it. It stays with you. You know, you're, mm -hmm. I mean, one point of, I remember having some interest, an interesting talk with um, a Jesuit priest who was advisor to three popes. And the interesting talk uh, uh, happened in like 15 minutes as he was, I had the photograph him in San Francisco, I was working at the examiner, San Francisco examiner. And then he had to, get to the airport to go to this next place it's on a book tour thing and it was one of the most intense discussions i've ever had in a 15-minute period and wow. the last thing he said to me he says our discussion is not finished yet and uh unfortunately i wasn't able to really meet up with him again and uh, and uh, for a long time and i think he passed away but i kept on thinking about the things that we talked about um it all has to do with uh what it means to be human, you know, uh, mm. how, how you go into things. Uh, one of the reasons I, I joined uh, Kamanga is because that was one of the inspirations that I was seeing at black photographers working on things, doing interesting work. And it's, it's an inspiration, you know, every day. I think about not just then, but now with my two associates here working, showing work here tonight. Uh, and, you know, Gordon Parks and, uh, and Roy DeCarber, you know, all these people were so human they were the human beings that really exhibited the best of what a human being could be under all kinds of difficult circumstances mm. and it's inspiring you know I, i've run into things where I, I should have been dead a number of times i got walked away executed three times in one particular place i got 
abducted in, uh, um, in Lebanon when I was there and had a contract on me for two, two weeks. I'm not going to go any reason why that happened. It's nothing I did, but, uh, but the, uh, the, <laughs> the outcome was interesting. And I got through it, you know. And at the times, you know, things that because of, uh, I think, the way I look at life, I also worked in the hospital for 11 years, which is a big lesson, uh, two different hospitals. And, you know, I, was, I wasn't even concerned about, to tell you the truth, about living or dying. You do the best you can, and you go out in the best way you know how, by doing your work, by, you know, meeting it head on. And that's, that sounds crazy, I know, talking to most people, but the thing is, um, how you live and how you die and how you enjoy life and how you express uh, uh, a sense of life it is so important. Um, and I mean, it can motivate you to do the things you need to do when you have the capability of maybe doing something that people can see and share and, and it's all over the world. You know, that's why uh, both my partners here are doing that kind of work in different ways and reach different levels of, of, of understanding of different people who see your work. And it's, it's a good thing. And I, I usually, it's hard for me to, uh, I, it's hard for me to talk about some of the stuff because uh, it's just it's a continuing thing. It's not over yet. I mean, I'm I'm retired. I've been retired from this university, uh, but it's been a great feeling. It's like because already I'm I'm into some new things that are that uh, speak to things I want to deal with, the things that I want to work on, uh, and it's it's like such a wonderful surprise. But life is a wonderful surprise. You know, yeah. Think about it that way. If you if you think of it the way you you'll never be under the gun really because the gun's always there but also the light and the stars and the beauty of life is always always there and and uh, that's how I try to deal with no matter what the circumstances the circumstances it's also a good reason for believing in God because God has protected me and, and moved me in certain places where I would have never gotten to that I I, I, tell, I could tell you I could sit and tell you stories all night that you wouldn't believe yeah. but things happen. And, and I marvel at, you know, how, how that worked out that way, but I don't have time to think about that. What you have time to think about is the work that you're doing. Hopefully that's, it's, uh, going a certain place that, that needs to go. And I try not to get in my own way mentally. You can, you can outthink some things, you know, I, I know you two guys, <laughs> fellow, uh, people here could understand that you can overthink something where you don't actually make the move you should move so um that you should do and and i try to you know you open yourself up to everything going on and if you do that you may be able to go places you weren't expecting to go the worst thing i can do is to bore the hell out of myself i don't want to do that because life isn't boring you know which means i'm sort of in the wrong wrong place if i do that um there's places that you go in some place that's hostile you know and and i say there's nothing for you here and you say to them that's okay. I understand. You know, I was working for a universe, uh, one of the magazines. I said, I just want to photograph what's here. And then something happened that happened within a few minutes of me making that comment. And before, I think they were thinking about whether to throw me out or shoot me or whatever. But then something happened as family came back from, they, they had to leave this, the mountainous area they were in because there's intensive fighting there, which is where I was going to cover that. And the way I photographed, this family had had to come back because they ran out of money in Beirut. They had to come up back up to the mountains. And under the uh, basis of that, these guys changed their whole mind. They told me, there's nothing here. There's no guns. There's no soldiers. There's nothing for you here. I said, I just want to photograph what's here. And then on the basis of the way I photographed that, then they showed me everything. They're firing down the street, offering to let me take a few shots with the guns. I said, no, I don't shoot guns right now. I shoot. <laughs> cameras <laughs> the cameras and then somebody fired behind my my head just for the hell of it you know and it was like uh, and i started laughing because it was so crazy i mean you know <laughs> what is that you know and it wasn't he didn't fire to make me frightened or anything it was just the uh, because they were they were they got in the mood because i was so easy going you know <laughs> so, yes. and um but you know that's the the whole thing um uh, we all work on different levels and, you know, sometimes we can surprise ourselves and raise, raise it to another, you know, higher level of understanding. And that's the thing that makes it really interesting. And, exactly. And, exactly. And, and go ahead. Well, I think it's a constant life is a constant education, living, 
being thing. It's a, it's a living thing. And, and uh, I mean, I, I'm doing so, so much work that, I, that I'm always behind right now. But there's a number of things, and just three things came up in the last five days that are really interesting. I'm looking forward to engaging in them. You know, I'm not going to talk about that, but it's it's like it's like we're not expecting you working. You're working, and school is ending here, and that's been fantastic. You know, and a number of my students, former students, have come and helped me move into my new place because I got flooded out my other place in in Austin. Oh, and in I, the Texas, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's been. I'm looking at the place here and it's like, hey, I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, my theory, my theory about retirement is that it really, the word itself says we are putting on new tires to go to new places. Absolutely. So your, your vision bears that out. And that's, that's the vision that I, I was hoping you could unwrap a little bit. And so I thank you for that. I don't even like the word retirement because I think about the movie Blade Runner. <laughs> retirement retiring uh uh executions <laughs> so, really so, so, so really they, they had this function for me i said you know i, I told them i don't like that word <laughs> you know yes let's, like, let's let's remove that word yeah, now in, that in addition that. in addition to that um you are a part of magnum and that in connection or in addition to Kemuinge, um, is really a major part of your life. So I'm hoping you can share a bit about that, how you became connected with it, what the organization really is, and its impact on you and your work. For those of us not a part of the photography world, um, that we need some explanation. Okay. Um, Magnum, the work of Magnum photographers was uh, inspiring that I saw people that became friends later, you know, there's Donna McCullen, you know, there's, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, Phil Jones Griffith, they were covering the Vietnam War. And I was just amazed at the work that they're putting in. And not, they weren't playing games. They weren't, uh, they weren't just following the, the dotted line and doing brilliant work. And, and actually, uh, Donald McCullen is now, he's been knighted since, uh, since a few years ago, he was knighted. And the mm. last time I saw him was in uh, Dubai and we were kidding each other about who's going to die first. You know? <laughs> Not too so much stuff. He wins the game, but he's still alive. So thank God. But, you know, uh, the work ins was inspiring. And when I was in art school, that's when I first started looking at the work. And I remember 68 was, 1968 was an extraordinary year. And that, that might be the, the um, close to the beginning, or maybe I noticed the stuff before, but that was like, boom, you know, really. Well, all the things that were going on in different places, not just in war zones, you know. And... What happened is that um, I, it took a long time for me to get a job, uh, basically because of racism, you know, and, but it didn't, wasn't going to stop. I mean, I had this idea of where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do with my work, you know, and so I just kept going and another series of circumstances, car breaking down and uh, meeting somebody who's uh, the, working in the newspaper, who's a, a features writer, he's the best writer on the, on the paper. And he says, would you like to see, he, he saw me as I was making a photograph because I was depressed and waiting for a, a bus that goes back to, comes back New York way. And, uh, and so I, I photographed somebody, that, you know, that, that's, that's closing the store. It's like late in the afternoon. And as I hit the shutter, shutter button, I see a reflection of a smiling face in this window. I turn around and then, there's this guy that says, I made the photograph, of course. I turned around, and this guy, Fred Kerr, says, I can see by your camera that you're a man of distinction because I happen to be using a Leica camera. A mm. camera that has served me well, that's been to every war zone, every place I've gone to, It's it's been there. You can tell it when you look at the camera. But that was like, it ended up getting a job, not then, but a, a year later, he took me to the newspaper where I met the the executive editor, so that came through. Then the two year, I was there for one year and went through uh, to, um, um, I got drafted sort of into the Detroit News, a much bigger paper. When I was thinking about going smaller, I wanted to move to Woodstock and maybe work for a paper in Kingston where I could pursue my, you know, my personal work. Um, so there, I was in Detroit for two years and then a San Francisco Examiner, I noticed that they were doing some interesting work I went there for just a vacation uh, because I had so much time accrued from working. And uh, I, anyway, some circumstances happened. I met the director of photography and then 
um, kept in touch. He said, keep in touch. And that's what I did. You talk every couple of months, you know, and, and then the, uh, all kinds of things happened. But finally, I got a job there. And the work that was the breakthrough work, I guess, that uh, got a lot of people's attention was the work that did in the Pink Palace in San Francisco, it was a housing project. And mm -hmm. then uh, I had the idea I wanted to go to Central America because I didn't understand the death squad thing in El Salvador. And I mean, that's, you know, one one sentence can start your your brain going into a certain direction and you're not even aware of it. Uh -huh. and since uh, the Jonestown had happened, they lost a photographer who I replaced, actually. And the, the reporter got shot. And, and it's a small enough paper where people were not really happy about going in harm's way again. But I decided I'd just go on my vacation, you know, and uh, so then uh -huh. the, my director of photography and it was a great guy and and uh, the, the city editor, they were great at doing practice. And so they did it right. We did a, 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 what eight of us did a primer on Central America and things that were going on. And that got the attention of Magnum. And that even that's a circumstantial thing that happened. But it ends up with me getting a phone call from the president when I was at my mentor's uh, place in New York City, preparing to go to, to Harvard for a Neiman Fellowship. And I thought it was a joke because the first words out of this person that called was, hello, I'm Philip Jones Griffin. I'd like to seduce you into joining Magnum. <laughs> I never even imagined anything like that because just, you know, it's not in my wheelhouse. You know, I just go and do the work. And but and that's what I'm the I'm the only for the only newspaper photographer that's ever been drafted into Magnum. Um, OK, um, now that's how you got there. But what is Magnum? You know, for Magnum, the for the rest of the world here, what is it? It's a what's well, considered, I guess, you know, like greatest uh, photo agency in the world. It has a history. It started in the, the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1947. Uh, four photographers had said, if we survive covering World War II, that they wanted to start a, a, a group, that organization that the best photographers and treated well and were able to work on things they wanted to do. And that's where it started. And um, so, uh, I was the first African American to to, to uh, actually be inducted into the place successfully, but so now you needed to be you needed to be welcomed into it. It wasn't something you could apply to. Oh, or... You can't apply. You can't apply. I didn't know that. I had no idea, and I probably wouldn't have applied because, you know, it's just history. I've been depressed uh, <laughs> or disappointed enough times where uh -huh. the only thing was to just do my work. Do yeah. what work I could. Yeah. I learned a lot from working in a hospital about people and, and, and things, along with all kinds of other research. If my place is filled with DVDs of every kind of thing you can imagine, and a lot of books that when I moved here, I couldn't imagine. I didn't realize how many books I've had and mm -hmm. magazines about different subjects. But it's like, you know, a passion. The thing about Magnum is that there's so many different people, different approaches to life and to what you photograph. And that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for is something that you know you, you uh, like somebody said well i photographed this like like eli reed or like Gil perez or something like that well they already have us so they're looking for you know stuff that really says something personal from the gut right. and and the best work that um that comes out of there is when original ideas from the people that are in there in fact there's there's one once there's a somebody who's new to magnum who was working there and they thought it was a good idea to uh stop um uh which we called there was something to stop uh let, allowing personal work to be uh go through the lab to mag them but that's crazy that's where the best work comes from it's like not from some something handed to you things right right because right. people see your work in some places and they want to you know use what you do that's that's what happens it's a that's one good reason for do, actually doing a book that means something to you because it's this is the, the, the element of who you are. Or in a movie, the movies uh, I've worked on, um, I, I, first I had about 80 photographs after I get started, but I dumped it and I dumped most of them. I've got it down to about 25, maybe 24 photographs. And three different studios told me it was the best portfolio they ever saw. <laughs> you know, you never usually hear that. Um, but because it was stuff that I liked, that I believed in, you know, that I thought was interesting. Yes. That's yes. the whole thing, you know. It's the reason why my two companions here do the work they do. That's really interesting because they—it's something they believe in. 
Exactly. Oh, Eli, it is almost a sin to limit this discussion for all, all of you, because we could really have the entire evening for each one of you. However, I thank you so much for all that you have shared. There will be more time as we move along, but I, I like to move the discussion in a different direction now. We're going to get to the conversational portion of the program. I have four areas of interest directly related to your association with Kamoinge. Feel free to make each one a conversation among yourselves that the rest of us are merely overhearing and listening to with great interest. So I, I'll just ask the question, whoever wishes can start, the rest can jump in. And when you're kind of finished with that question, I'll know and move on to the next one. So first, what has being a part of Kamuinge meant to you and your work? I, I, I if I can go first, I think it's, it's been a, a bridge for me. Um, it's like opened up like a whole other chapter being able to be around um, other, other photographers, other African-American photographers that have similar interests, but a different eye um, and a different philosophy, maybe even a different background, but we kind of all can come together as a family. Um, but when I left Rochester and I came to New York City, um, and New York City area, I, I knew I was going to be a part of Kamonge. I that was just a dream that I had, and I I just had to fulfill it. It you know, um, and it's it's worked for me. I've been a a, a member since uh, two thousand one, which was a very challenging time because I was just starting graduate school. So for that first two years, I couldn't be you know really but so active, but. As soon as graduate school was over, then I was able to, you know, jump right in. And um, I, I was looking at my um, uh, at my resume, and I and let's see, one, two, three. I've been part of eight or nine shows that we've done, and of course, been published in two of Kamange's books. So you know, when I was thinking back on that experience. Um, and how each one of us was able to make it happen. I mean, sometimes to make a show happen, we had to help each other frame work. <laughs> you know, we had to pick each other up. I mean, you know, it, it was a, it, it's a family connection. It's really, really a family connection. Sometimes we had to put a, like a little extra coins into the pot, you know, to be able to pay for a space or, you know, whatever, but, but we did whatever we had to do to see that the name stayed out there and that our mission was fulfilled and is being fulfilled and that there's a future for Kamonge and new people coming into Kamonge. Thank you. Yeah, the, Thank you, um, Mr. Colette. Um, you want to go out, Eli? Yeah, I was just saying, it, it's interesting that, uh, I mean, to me, uh, when I first heard about Kamonge, I was like, astonished you know it's like because of the quality of the work and i i didn't you know, i hadn't known it existed and so that's something i mean to me the two biggest things in photography in cer certain ways to me that that happened to me was getting into kamange mm -hmm. and getting into magda i mean they're so similar in different ways you know because it's again people doing things that they desire to do and it's like there's no other I mean, six, 1963, right? There's 62, it was 63. I think it was 63. 63. Yeah. 63. Yeah. 1963. And, and uh, you know, that's pretty, uh, pretty amazing that in spite of all this other nonsense that, that goes along, that this people are still producing work. I mean, and the book Timeless is a, such a fantastic book. That's my favorite book from, 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 you know, but there's so many things. And you see the individuality of, of, the, of the photographers, Kamangi, coming out in that book. Very powerful book, really. Uh, Thank so. you. Um, well, for me, to be honest with you, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important inclusion um, into a very historic organization. Um, I often say that, you know, I'm too queer for the Black community and too Black for the queer community. 
Um, you know, so Komonge is, is a group of black folks who accepts me as their sister, as their daughter. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the secretary of the group. So I kind of, I don't know, sort of take charge of the meetings and make sure it, it you know, keeps rolling along. And I do it as uh, delicately as I can. Um, so that's probably, you know, this idea of family and, and a photographic family. You know, I, I feel like a lot of times you have this amazing a group of people when you're in college um, to talk to, to about art. But as we get older, sometimes we kind of lose that community um, yeah. and especially a, a black community, you know? So it, for me, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of joy and um, knowing that like, like John Penner Hughes, for instance, uh, John is, is one of our members and um, one of our wonderful members. And uh, you know, he actually gave me my first portfolio review when I was in college. My, we come from the same hometown in Montclair, New Jersey. Mm. And my mom knew that he was a photographer. So she reached out to him. And I think it was like on uh, Easter break or something like that. I was probably a junior in college. And uh, he, he let me come to his studio. I think then it was around like the thirties. And uh, you know, I, I realized in hindsight that that was kind of the first entry into feeling like a, a real photographer, you know? And so, you know, I love to, to tease him and, and remind him about it all the time because, you know, now at this point, now it almost feels like we're kind of the same age. You know how it is like when you're like 20 and someone is like 30 or 40, they seem so much older, but now, you know, we seem in, in many ways on the same plane. Um, but I think that's also in, in, you know, in conclusion is that I feel that we all respect each other and respect each other's work. And, um, you know, it's just about, um, you know, especially thinking about these times, you know, you know, you have a group of people who got your back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And, and each of you have such an interesting, different approach to it. And I really appreciate hearing that. Um, secondly, do you see your own participation in the group changing the group, its focus, its energy, or do you simply see the group giving you, you know, the varied, the varied supports that you mentioned? I'm sorry, I was spacing out. Can you say that again? Sure. Do you see your own participation in the group changing the group? being, you know, a, a real element for change in the group or not? It's focus, it's energy. Do you see yourself being an element of change? I think the, the, the existence of the group changes a lot of things. I think it inspires people that the same way I was, you know, inspired when I first heard about Kamanga, you know, when the, and I think that's like a, it, it'd be probably influenced many more people than we think sometimes, you know, because the people are quietly watching, mm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I think in that way, it's like one of these subtle things, but it's not so subtle because it impacts a lot of people, a lot of photographers, particularly black photographers, people of color. You know? mm. Also, I, I had you finish, Eli? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think also, um, because I've been with the group for quite some, you know, for quite a, a number of years now, mm -hmm. um, I've seen different leadership styles. Ah. And um, that has definitely changed the group. Um, it, there's, there are more females into the group, which we just, you know, decided at one point we needed a little bit more female energy in the group. <laughs> And, and it's kind of, um, and, and I, I think, I can't quite get the thought out, but I, I think I felt it strongest when we were doing the Black Women Show, which was a couple of years ago now. And um, when we do a show, there's this fervor, you know, there's this, we're all bringing images and we're walking around tables and we're trying to put the show together. And it's just a, you know, just this energy comes alive and, you know, and I'm like always photographing the group because I, that's just what I do. 
Um, so yeah, so it's it's changed. I, I can't quite express how it's changed, but under each president and vice mm -hmm. president, you know, we've we've moved in a different direction, but we keep moving in a strong direction mm -hmm. and I think a powerful direction. Um, we have right now without, you know, revealing too much business, yeah. but we have two um, female consultants that our president, Adja Cowens, has brought in. And I'm telling you, we're really getting it together. I mean, there are just simplistic housekeeping things that we're taking care of that have taken a while to really take care of. And we've mm. needed them for a long time, but it's helping us, I think, to really keep ourselves as an organization um, really on the map. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've definitely seen, you know, changes, changes in the group, you know, for, but, but, but what's interesting also is that, um, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts did a seven week series on the early members of Kamoinge. And that was a whole other thing that mm -hmm. in fact, there's a book that they published. I think that was also, um, being sold. Um, at the Whitney and just to read about, because I was like a kid at the time these guys were forming Kamoinge. And you know, when they were using a dark room and larger on the floor, because there was not a table or there was no dark room, but they were just doing the best that they could. And, you know, just to envision that happening when I was just a babe in diapers thinking about photography, you know, shooting with like a little point and shoot. So we have some very powerful roots yeah. and some of the early members of Kamoinge are still very much and very active in the group. So they brought along that history. And I think once you know your history that helps you to form your future. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a whole lot. Yeah. You know, and it's some of that writing that helped me formulate that question because, you know, uh, having read what it was like then, you know, I wondered how you saw it now. So thank you. Anybody else want to respond to that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me personally, it, um, you know, I guess sort of like following on what, with what Colette's saying, you know, um, I, when I was in college, I remember, uh, strongly remember seeing Anthony Barthos's uh, photographs um, mm -hmm. in books, you know, in the 70s. Um, and even now, there still is a, a huge lack of seeing um, Black photographers in, um, in art books, you know, uh, in museums. And, um, I just loved his work, you know? <clears throat> and so now, you know, he used to be our, our president and, you know, we're like, we're buddies, you know? I call him Tony and, you know, <laughs> when we see each other, we love, you know, we hug each other and, you know, um, we're, we've, uh, I've done a little writing for him for some of his, uh, one of his projects. And, you know, so now I'm like standing like shoulder to shoulder to speak with these, a lot of the, the photographers who I admired so much as a kid, you know, and now I'm like, I'm in this amazing organization with them, you know, so it's a real, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a very uh, momentous and very um, special. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm super proud that, that the original members were um, honored in this show that uh, Colette speaks about. Um, and also it, it just left, left the Whitney museum on it was a beautiful show and so um it was you know for me it was so neat just to stand around and see all the different people you know like Eli was saying like just seeing all the different people different ages different colors um you know looking at the work and I'm like I know that person you know mm -hmm. and so yeah uh, I mean, we've been able to keep the, the the group together um over COVID because now we do zoom meetings um but I do miss the the camaraderie um, that we had when we used to see each other. Uh, you know, we would meet um, Danny, who's here, I think. Hi, Danny. Uh, we, he works at Columbia, and so he used to um, let us use one of the rooms there at Columbia. Um, 
And that was just really nice to see everyone actually give a hug and, you know, kind of talk for before the meeting started. And like Azure, who's here, our president now, hey, Azure, um, you know, he's got some amazing stories. Danny's got some amazing stories, you know, about jazz, you know, and all kinds of things that affect our lives, you know, and so it's, it's, um, it, I'll just end with it's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Eli, any word with that? Has your own participation changed the group? Do you think or not? Did we lose Eli? Oh, he has to unmute. You have to unmute, Eli. I, I think that, uh, um, as Colette was saying, you know, you're sort of, and what uh, Lo was saying, you're, you're sort of been inspired just by being, being in, in meeting, even if you're irritated for whatever reason, it's like the strong <laughs> bond that, that you're really happy to be part of the group. You know, it's, um, I think we, we probably inspire each other. It, you know, like look at work, of, you know, Lola's work and, and the Colette's way and then uh, our, our president and Mark, I mean, all the different members that are, you know, we look at the work and we're, it sort of keeps on pushing you a little bit more, you know, mm -hmm. so edge. I mean, mm -hmm. you can be, I'm, I'm, I'm all about work is really important to me and watching, you know, seeing the, what everybody else is doing. It's, uh, it's amazing, you know, mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, it's so, it's the same, it's the same thing, the, the magnum, there's so, there's such a similarity, except, you know, mm -hmm. in so many ways that, you know, you get inspired by this other work that you're seeing. So you're not just alone, because you can yes. be, you know, it can be a very lonely place to be when you were just, and most people will not understand that level when you just, so I think it's, it's a, it's a mutual kind of enjoyment, of, like a family, the family. Yes. And, yes. and that makes it things it makes things much, much better, much more hopeful in some ways. So mm -hmm. you're not alone. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And um, time is rapidly going. Um, one of my questions dealt with um, civil rights events that all of you have had experience with, but each of you have talked a bit about that. So I'm going to let that go. Um, I think I'm just gonna avoid the additional question as well and move into the final segment where each of you have some time to speak at depth, at a bit of depth. I mean, time isn't allowing too much depth um, about several pieces of your work. Um, so Robert, we're, yeah, we're gonna be wanting to look at um, Eli's because that's where we're starting and uh, let me see where I am here. Um, uh, it, the final segment gives each of our guests that. Um, and because all of us are probably familiar with the saying, the last shall be first, and we all like the sound of that, we're going to begin this section with Eli. So our audience can see the photos, and so the floor and the screen is yours. This is a the day after 9 11 and i i was t been teaching i was teaching for 25 years i guess it was something like, maybe a little longer um uh, at this uh, at this military the united states military uh, get to uh, school for teaching uh military photographers and oh. we each uh, five of us would each have us uh, five students and and what happened is when 9 11 happened uh I mean, everybody who was in New York probably remembers that pretty well. And, and it's like bringing the war comes home, you know, it's some things that you're not surprised by. But this picture was on the, the second day. Uh, one of the um, military people that, that, you know, got to know, said, have called me up and says, is there anything I could do do for you? I said, yeah, take me to nine, and I take me to a, a ground, ground, you know. Ground zero. Ground zero. And, so I met him uh, at, a, at a place in New York and we walked from the bottom of you know, uh, Manhattan into where 9-11 was happening and it was, it was a very surreal thing. And it, me, I remember meeting a, 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 a fireman who'd come from Ohio, he grew up from Ohio because he wanted to do something um, helpful and 
you know, there's a 10,000 mile stair, you know, and mm. they said, we need more people down there. We need, we need more people. And then I ran to an uh, African-American, he's an a undercover guy who lost 11 friends that day. And this is one time when, you know, your you know, gut feeling deserts you. I photographed him and and I was with the, the guy from the military was with me, taking me through the stuff and walked away. I said, this, I, did, I, I didn't like what I photographed. I, it wasn't connecting with anything. I went back to him. I, I told the, the guy, I said, I got to go, go see him again. The guy was hurting also, you know, and, you, you know, there's that thing you're, you're a doctor in a way, you know, if you're a photojournalist and you should do no harm and you, that's not the last thing, but this is also important history. And I told them, for, I said, this is strange, but I said, I, I don't feel like I've actually captured what I should have gotten. Do you mind if I, you know, make another photograph of you? And that wasn't any better. And I just, I just, uh, I felt, I felt like I failed uh, in, in a way, but this whole thing was so out of control and, and and then I, about 15 minutes later, I ran into this picture, which was saying something to me. It was like going to hell, and, and it's going to take work to, to recover from that. And so that's what made the picture work well to me. And I didn't realize mm -hmm. I'd gotten it. I thought I'd gotten it. I was also shooting with a panoramic camera, and I was leaving, I think, the next, the next day when Magnum decided to do this book because 11 photographers were in, were in, or happened to be in town the night before. And... and um, and I was going to flying to, to London, and I I, to, I talked to the person who was monitoring, you know, putting this stuff together. I thought it was a panoramic, but this was the picture you know, I, I made. It was it's such a confusing time in some ways. No matter if you covered all kinds of other stuff, uh, all kinds of difficult things, it's still it's your where you where you live, you know. So you get a feeling what it's like. Uh, mm -hmm. There's somebody who's in that. I mean, I'm thinking right now. Israel, it was Israel and Lebanon, what's going on right now. And, and part of me w wishes I could go there. And, and, and because you, you know, you meet so many people, I have so many friends there on both sides, you know, and, and it, uh, and you want to go there. But uh, mm. like that. next picture. Uh, this is in Lebanon. This is the picture that I, I mentioned before when these guys tell me there's, there's nothing for you here. It is, and, and, um, and a series of pictures I made, they saw me working and I was not screwing around and it changed them. And uh, that's one of the pictures I made from. You know, oh, neat. Yeah. That's it. That, this, Robert. This, that's his grandson. Yeah. This is Tupac. Um, um, my, my education in, in rap music or hip hop came on the movie uh, Poetic Justice. I didn't know much about rap and then um, and Tupac was very big, but I still didn't know much, really. And he had his shirt off at one point, and early on in the movie, I said, listen, I, I want to do a portrait of you without your shirt. And he, and I t explained to him my reasons for that, and, you know, and uh, he agreed with me, and he said, yeah. And so we, we talked about it, you know, every week we'd be talking, when he was, he was on set, we'd be talking about different possibilities and way, because I wanted to interpret something, you know, that made sense that could go, you know, get to him in a way that, that would work. And then, and finally, I was doing the, the posters, uh, pictures for the poster, and we had some time, and I went up to him. I had told my um, my um, assistants, I had two assistants, I said, listen, um, he's going through some stuff now, so he's fine to say hello, and, you know, don't get any long involved conversations because he's, first of all, he's acting, he's working, he's, he's a really good actor, and also he's going to this other stuff, and I don't want to, you know, see him get in the wrong direction, not because of my photograph, but just, I, you know, he felt for him. He was going through some stuff. And so, and then somebody came up and said, to another crew person said, hey, guess what? Did you hear what happened with Tupac? I said, no, what? He said, he just punched a hole in his trailer. And I turned to my two assistants who were standing there. I said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So then, uh, I, time to do the photograph. I, I decided at a particular time, okay, this is the day. Um, I said, Tupac, it's time. And he nodded his head and followed me to where I wanted him to stand. And I made three frames, and that was it. Because when he was, he was taking his shirt off, that's when I stopped him. Because he was sort of fragile and feeling, and there's just stuff going on. I felt for him, and uh, that was the picture. And then when he walked away, I, I, I said quietly to one of my assistants, I said, I think he's going to be dead within a, a year or two, you know, or, or else in jail. Not because he, he was supposed to be, but because of the some of the guys just hanging with, you know, that weren't helping much. 
Yeah. And then I was still unpleasantly surprised uh, when he did, he did die within that period of time. Mm. Uh, next picture. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's it for, for yours. Um, we're moving now to Colette. Colette, I don't know where you come in your family, but you'll always be the beloved middle one here. So here are your photographs. Colette, unmute. Oh, excuse me. Uh, okay, I've unmuted. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you are. Yes. So, so I'm kind of like the second of the two families. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it fits. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm I'm very um pleased with the three photographs selected because um these are what I consider to be signature photographs of mine. Mm -hmm. Um. This was a photo from uh, the Hurricane Katrina series. Mm. And uh, the lady on the stair is uh, Mrs. Hayes. She's 92. And she's living with her, her daughter and her grandson that has multiple sclerosis. And um, I met this, uh, I met her mother, Mrs. Uh, uh, Alma. It was her name, Mrs. A Miss Alma, I called her. And I met her. Um, through some social activists um, in um, New Orleans. And I spent about a day and a half with them just photographing, you know, and so they're in a West, they're in a community called Algiers, which is the West side of New Orleans. And um, she had her own home, her daughter had her own home and both of their homes were destroyed. So they came together as a family and um, are living in this particular area while their houses are being reconstructed. Mm. Um, but I, I, I have another picture that I submit, I believe I submitted it, and it's a picture of Miss, Miss Alma on the telephone. She's got on African garb and her mother is standing next to her looking at photographs, sort of like of a past time. And her mother has a very sullen look on her face, Mrs. Uh, Hayes. And Miss Alma is just on the phone trying to organize something in the community that was going to happen on that Sunday. Mm. So it's, it's, it was good photographing them and getting to know them. Mm. Um, this is a, a photograph that I call Bucket in White. And it's actually uh, Garth Fagan uh, dancers. And um, at the time I, I was taking classes with Garth Fagan, um, who were based in Rochester. And this picture was made in 83. And uh, Garth would let me photograph during rehearsals. And the company, everybody called them the company, was about to uh, do an annual performance at the Joyce Theater in New York City. And they did that, I believe, every October. I think that they still do. I saw them a few years ago, just a few years ago. And, uh, but it was, it was part of a series of photographs that I was doing where I was kind of playing around with tungsten light, tungsten film, um, a slide film, and also various shutter speeds and f-stops. So what I loved about that particular approach was I never knew exactly what I was going to get. Mm. So it was always a surprise when I processed that E6 film <laughs> and mounted it myself. A lot of it I processed myself, you know, to save money. Um, so it's kind of a favorite. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a favorite of mine. Nice. Um, Hello. Uh, I, I call this Sam's base. And it's the uh, beautiful hands of my dear friend, uh, Samuel Harps, who is a playwright. And uh, Sam and I met at the Bergen Record in the early 90s. Sam was writing obits for the newspaper and in between writing you know, his plays. And they got pissed off at him when he said he was writing his play. And he worked like a midnight shift. But anyway, I've been photographing Sam for about 30 years or so. And um, he had this base, his base, it's called a blonde base, and he had it built, he had it constructed from a um, professional uh, 
person that you know does this kind of work so i went to his house one day and you know with my lights and i said oh sam well, i've got to make some pictures of you and this is what we came across this is what we came out with no, oh, it, it is truly beautiful. And, you know, I feel like that really speaks about, you know, the people who have said, you know, there's always this element of um, artistic elevation in your work that this one really says that to me. Yeah, I've never heard that. I'd like to know who wrote that. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I read it. <laughs> so <laughs> I will try to find it again and, and share it with you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You, you Lola, know, I am so, oh, pardon me. Oh, no, I was just saying what's so special is that artists really do support one another. Oh, and yeah, that's so important. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Lola, we are so interested. I can't wait to hear the commentary on this work. <laughs> so, Lola, where are you? And unmute and have your view up um i don't know how to put my view up oh, you're up you're up we're we're seeing you all right you're good okay all right so um thanks to everyone for hanging in there and listening to our stories uh, our words of wisdom um so this this series is called uh, syzygy the vision and uh, i started it in uh, 2019 at the uh, Center for Photography at Woodstock. I had, I got, I was lucky enough to have a residency for the, for the month of August. And um, when I look back at this, I mean, that's actually the, the house behind it is the uh, artist residency house. So I had that whole house uh, to myself for a whole month. Uh, at first, it was kind of scary because it's kind of in the woods, and I was like, oh no, <laughs> uh, you know, they always. I don't know, in horror films, it's always like the black person that gets killed first. So I was just <laughs> like, <laughs> but then I, I just thought to myself, well, if that's the way I'm gonna die, this is the way I'm gonna die. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I spent every morning on that porch reading books and um, I really wasn't planning on doing any photography for this residency, residency. I really just wanted to center myself and read and sort of figure out where I was going next. But um, previously, I had met this woman, Jayashree, who uh, was, uh, you mentioned earlier, I was at a show at the Ford Foundation. So Jayashree is the, uh, was the curator. And so uh, we met in London at this a show I had at Autograph uh, Gallery in 2019, yeah, that same summer. And she said she was getting ready to do, the, the last show she was doing, she was curating at the uh, Ford Foundation was uh, around Afrofuturism. So I thought, she said, if you can get something together in the next couple of weeks, then go for it, right? So um, so I did. So the first thing I did was I ran back to my friend's flat and I ordered a, a helmet, um, you know, an, an astronaut's helmet, um, thinking about the future. Um, when I saw that it had the orange trim, I was like, okay, great. I can bring my, uh, my prison uniforms in because I have a lot of prison uniforms because I've been, I think, probably ever since I was a child, uh, you know, and I'm sure most people that look like me know that this idea of police brutality has been around, I don't know, ever since we jumped off the ship, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, it's something concerns me. You know, when I looked at, I don't know if anyone has seen 13th, Ava DuVernay's uh, film about incarceration, you know, the exponential rate of, of people who look like me, um, is I couldn't have actually, to be honest with you, I couldn't watch the end of the film because it's just too horrific. Um, and so I thought I would bring that idea in, um, you know, even thinking about, you know, the, the words that they use around COVID like lockdown, like we don't really know what lockdown means, right? People in prisons know what lockdown is. Thinking about how many people in prison are COVID positive and that we don't know about that. So there's so much wrapped into this and then when you're thinking about Africa futures, I mean, thinking about the past, the present, and the future, right? And a lot of it is reimagining. So you're reimagining like the past because whoever wrote those books didn't look like us, right? The history books, his story books aren't written by people who look like me for the most part. Um, so I can reimagine my whole history, right? And so if I can bring joy into my history, my past, and bring it into my present, then I could definitely go into the future knowing that in, this is sort of my artistic, my artistic license is that knowing that the future is going to be a good one and I'm going to be included in it 
and all the people who look like me are going to have an equitable uh, presence in their lives, right? And so that's pretty much what the series is about. Is there another picture in the? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so I kind of, um, you know, because I was in, 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 uh, in, in Woodstock, and it's funny that you said, Eli, you mentioned Woodstock earlier, um, you know, Woodstock doesn't have a lot of black people. So when I was like, hmm, wonder who I'm gonna use, I kind of looked at the mirror and I thought, I'm gonna do, use myself as this avatar, right? And so mm -hmm. um, it's really been an, an amazing experience uh, because I, I kind of, you know, I have a lot of friends who are performance artists. And so when I'm, you know, when I'm posing, I'm kind of feeling the spirits and I'm kind of, you know, feeling like whatever I feel during the day and just doing my best emoting. Um, not half as good as Viola Davis, but you know, I kind of, <laughs> I work towards uh, emoting these, these, you know, my ancestors. Um, and so this one is taken in Brighton um, in London. Um, and you can see, I have like sort of these African beaded um, bracelets on. So I sort of go from those to um, the, um, the handcuffs. Um, so yeah, so just sort of using these different kinds of like symbols to talk about um, this idea of Afrofuturism and, you know, um, these crate, you know, I was in Kingston, actually, I, Eli, um, these are on the way to Kingston from Woodstock and uh, these domes. And so um, I was like, oh my God, I have to come back there and photograph. Uh, so this was actually the first day that I, I started doing this series. And um, it's, like I said, it was, it was, it's been a great series to do in all my life, I've never done a self-portrait series. Of course, I've done self-portraits, you know, throughout the years. Um, but once COVID had kicked in, it worked out really well too because it's, you know, photography is a pretty good social distancing uh, activity uh, outside. Uh, and so I, uh, I started doing a lot more pictures of myself in uh, in Manhattan in this sort of quiet city. You know, I could just stand in the middle of the street and take photographs. Um, so it's a uh, like everything else, it's ongoing. You can see one back here. Um, and yeah, hopefully uh, a particular museum is interested in acquiring a couple of the pictures from the series. So um, yeah, I've got a residency this summer at um, in Fire Island um, where it's called a Bofo Fire Island Residency, which I will be doing some more. I wanna do some, uh, um, some sort of, uh, uh, baptismals like in the water and sort of just really kind of think about like how I was raised my religion and think about hymnals and all kinds of uh, spiritual uh, sources that are part of my soul I think that's mm -hmm. pretty much it in a in a capsule <laughs> oh thank you so much for putting it in a capsule we were really scurrying here at the end um, wow is all I can say. Um, and I, I would ask now, though it's really difficult, um, that we give our guests a vigorous round of applause since we're unable to give them the standing ovation that they so strongly deserve. So can we have a vigorous round of applause from everyone. <laughs> and that, that will wrap up the prepared portion of the program. Um, I'm wondering, Ed, Edna, do we have any comments or questions that we might be able to buzz through? Um, um, turn it over to you. Yes, so we have a, a couple of questions. I think that to, to different degrees they've been answered, but uh, the one which really applies to all of you and um, maybe Lola, you, can, you already touched on it, but applies to all of you is with the magnitude and scale of the various disciplines you've contributed to, how do you remain present and bring to your full self to every to bring yourself to or be true to yourself at every opportunity that or every different assignment you go into? Um, yeah, that might be one for you. Okay, I'll I'll start. Um, I mean, for me, I don't really do much commercial work. My work is pretty much fine art oriented, um, so that means that I. I'm generally the person who makes the idea up about the project. Um, and so for me, the way I stay present is, you know, I collaborate with my models. So it's not just, it's like, well, I have this idea and these 
these particular people fit into that series. And many people fit into different series, right? I, I have some people that I photograph twice, uh, one for one series and one for another. But for me, it's, um, it's really a communion. And so when I'm there photographing the person, you know, I often say that, you know, I mentioned earlier that my work is about beauty. And so for us black folks, you know, the idea of beauty um, is starting to creep into magazines and um, mm -hmm. we're starting to get credit for it. But, um, you know, we, you know, we spend our lives with, in our homes feeling warm and comfortable. And then when we go outside, as the world is now beginning to understand, you know, we can, someone can just look at you like you're, you know, filth of the earth, or, you know, I can go onto a bus. I'm getting to a good point here. Um, I can get onto a bus mm -hmm. and I've had it happen several times, ladies, and I won't say what color, but ladies take their bags and hold them tight as if I'm going to take them, mm -hmm. you know, and like, I mean, for me, that was one of the things that Barack uh, brought was that I felt like when I walked on the bus, like people thought that might think that I even had like a college degree, let alone two masters as well. You know, I started feeling a little bit more pride. But anyway, my point is that for me, like this communion with my model is where I'm very present. You know, I set my equipment and I'm, t I'm talking to them. And then when we're getting ready to, you know, I ask them to gaze into my lens you know, that's where we make this connection. And it's really beautiful and it's really hard to explain. Often when I have interviews, I, I, I feel like it's kind of magic, you know? And so I, I have all my life kind of felt like I am giving this almost like a counselor. Like I give, I give my community a chance to just relax and feel beautiful for two hours. No matter what happens before that or after that, for two hours, I can, we can commune together and we can make this beautiful picture and, you know, and then going forward, you know, people will be able to look at these images and, and hopefully um, their biases will sort of fall away. Oh, thank you. I really like to jump in because I have a quote from Anthony Barboza that really underscores what Lola just said. And this is the quote. I noticed that when Kamoenge members took photographs, there was a spiritual relationship with the subject. You are looking at the subject, but you are looking, but you are feeling the photographer as well. That's why photography is autobiographical more than people realize. Mm -hmm. So, Colette or um, Eli, do either of you have a response or you want to let it at that? I, I think that um, Tony was, was absolutely right. And I know that I've experienced that spirituality on a number of in a number of different places, um, a number of different places which were black countries. I've absolutely experienced a spiritualness. Um, sometimes I certainly feel it. I, I think it's it's my own photography rejuvenates me. And I'll give an example. I was doing taxes the other night, and I was doing some <laughs> writing before that. And I just said, you know, let me just go back to the to to working on these photographs of the Matuchin show because that fed me and that kind of gave me like that. And it's a spiritual energy. I it it may be a little bit hard to explain but it definitely is a spiritual energy. It, it energizes you in no other way that, that I can experience in life. Um, a, a good friend of mine who's a photographer uh, who taught at RIT, Oma Bawali Ayurende, some of you may know him, um, but he helped me to take my pictures out of the closet, if you will. They were in boxes, framed in boxes. And he says, oh, Fournier, let me look at your work. <laughs> you know, come on, you got to show me some work. And he helped me to take these pictures. That are, and then after that, you know, I worked towards having my first show in 1984, my first one woman show. So, but there is a spirituality to our work. Abs absolutely. 
it is difficult to define, but you know when you feel it. Mm. And it also projects itself in that, what I call that decisive moment, which isn't an original term, of course, but it, it projects itself in that decisive moment because you feel and you really connect with the image and you, you know when you got it, you know when you have it. Yeah, so thank you. I, I, I agree with every single thing you just said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know when, I, when I've done, I mean, it's, it's funny, the first time, uh, strangely it's the first time that uh, i heard somebody say that i just immediately connected with it and uh you know it's there's there's a, a spiritual thing going on there's another thing going on i i remember once someone asked their doing a, a, a talk how do you get from being you know how do you avoid being bored and i said if you if you are bored perhaps you're boring because how can you, how can you not be excited about uh, the spirit or whatever you call it. I didn't call it a spirit, but it was that's what I was thinking. Uh, so, so it's like every time when you you get into a thing, you know when you're on, you know when you're, you're doing something right. Like I did some pictures of somebody working at a documentary, done a documentary on, and I liked a lot of pictures I did while we were shooting a documentary because I always had I was shot still photographs even while shooting with a you know a video camera, and and. Uh, the thing is that uh, when I wanted to do some other photographs, that he was interested in doing something, and I was working with a, another person uh, who was in the picture with him, I really realized they weren't as good as I would have hoped, you know? And, and then it hit me, I mean, weeks later, this is what I should be doing. So now I'm arranging to go back in there because you need that connection, that spiritual connection that transfers something valuable in there. And it doesn't matter if it's mm -hmm. one or two people, but except this other person, they were sort of not, you know, I, I can't blame them. It's like I couldn't get past something. I didn't even realize mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. because I was trying, but now mm -hmm. I know what I have to do. So yeah. I'm very really excited by that. Oh, thank you so much. Edna, anything else that you have to say? Um. I think for me, I'll just say something uh, very uh, quickly and maybe just to, to wrap things from for, for where this uh, particular event fits in with the exhibition taking place uh, here in, in, in the store in Metachan, is that, um, I mean, I wanted this initially, the exhibition to take place in, in February because I thought it would make a, give a richer dimension to, um, to February Black History Month and all the activities and things that were going on then, including something we have in here, which is posters from kids from uh, fifth grade kids from one of the middle schools here. So in that regard, even if this didn't start in February, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing that it's going on now and till the end of June. Um, but it's certainly what I think I appreciate from what you've all said is that it's uh, that you're capturing b beauty, that you see, you see your images through a, a certain lens of beauty. And I think that is something I particularly want always in these stores that when people come in here, that they are looking for something to, you know, beautiful things help us tell our own stories or to tell, create a new story. And I think your images do manage to do that, that, you know, they are all beautiful. They something beautiful you either, that either reflects or that you observe and with it, you can take it forward to uh, continue telling a story or creating your own story or an experience begins here in the store that um, that is positive so thank you for that thank you and that then brings us to the conclusion of this conversation your words lola colette eli your images have given us much to consider to remember to discuss among ourselves you have spent a lifetime taking the mundane and bringing the beauty out and giving us truly great photos defined as one person acknowledged as images that we cannot forget. And so I must offer one final thanks and say good night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. That was lovely. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all. It's been such a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yes. Thanks to everyone that came along. Appreciate you. Thank Brilliant. You. And come to Metachan here. <laughs> <laughs>
yes. the exhibition is going on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you, guys. No, good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you for your good night. support. <laughs> Bye -bye.